Hi, y'all. I'm Joe, your host and Cannabis Lifestyle Guide. I'm super excited to have Daniel Fink from Down Ohm Farms on the podcast this week. Daniel, thanks for uh, hanging out, having a smoke sesh with me. Awesome. Stoked to be here. Yes. And if you didn't catch Daniel on Roll With Me last week, um, we'll be sure to include that in the show notes, but you need to check that out. It was, uh, he gave us a little preview of what we're going to have a long form chat about today, which is why we should give a shit about regenerative farming people. <laughs> right, Daniel, I guess if I summed it up, that's what it is for me. That, that is what it's about. Uh, we, we, we want more people to understand the value and the purpose and the principles of regenerative farming and what that's doing for the planet. Absolutely. And then locally, we'll zoom in towards the end about knowing your farmer and, you know, how we can um, make an impact for our local farmers um, who really are continuing to hone the craft of cannabis farming. So let's start off, you know, for you to be as passionate as you are about regenerative farming, I feel like you must have some origin story something that happened or, you know, where did this come from for you? Um, so I guess my, my background is, is complex. It's a bit diverse. Um, I, I was growing cannabis plants as a teenager. I started very young, uh, based on my interest in cannabis specifically. Uh, back then, organic practices were a few and far in between. It was hard to learn anything about that specifically around cannabis. And I learned um, a chemical industrial style of growing cannabis as a teenager. And then as I got older into my 20s, um, I took on some other jobs at one point. I was, um, I was a florist and an orchid cultivator. And through that time working with cut flowers, I learned to recognize how dirty uh, the agricultural industry is it was around that time in my early 20s, I became interested in natural medicines and eating organically and holistically myself and realized that not only cut flowers, but all food crop production, conventional food crop, crop production is riddled with pesticides and chemical fertilizers, which degrade the soils, degrade the environment and are in no way sustainable. Um, it was some years after that time as an orchid cultivator that I had incorporated more organic practices into my life. Uh, I had become a yoga teacher for a number of years and uh, really started taking health seriously. And then I stepped back into cannabis growing um, in my late twenties. When I moved to the area that I live in now, uh, Grass Valley, Nevada city, this is about an hour north of Sacramento in California, Sierra Foothills. Um, my very first night in town, I was brought to a memorial for an organic farmer. And this was a food farmer, someone that was well respected in the community. Hundreds and hundreds of people showed up to honor this person's legacy and the hundreds of farmers that they had taught and in turn spreading um, good agriculture practices around the area. And I was blown away by the community that I saw here in Grass Valley uh, around sustainable agriculture. And I dove in head first. Uh, this is almost mm, 12 years ago. And, Did you uh, say 12 years ago? Yeah. And that's when I, I first started implementing uh, no-till uh, practices into my gardens. And then I started having a worm farm, having a worm farm was, I think the very first tangible step I made towards sustainable practices. And it didn't all happen overnight. It happened incrementally. Many years ago, I operated my garden, uh, much like most other farmers with uh, bottled fertilizers and lots of bags of fertilizers and imported materials, which all come uh, with costs beyond the dollar, uh, the carbon footprint cost. Everything that you need to import onto a farm is, is shipped and moved around using petrochemicals uh, and fuel. So all that adds up to 
less sustainable. Um, for a number of years now, I've been moving towards as close to what I call a closed loop system as possible, uh, meaning I import almost nothing onto my farm. I make my own worm castings, I make my own composts, and all of those with cover crop rotations build my soils naturally from the indigenous resources I have. And uh, it also then works with the indigenous microbiome which is a, a very important part of this. So thank you. That is an amazing overview to kick us off into, you know, kind of spelling out what are these pr principles of regenerative agriculture? Because you said you, you know, lay, started layering things in, doing it as you could. And so what were these principles that you were following as you did that? Absolutely. So pr principles of regenerative agriculture, uh, Regenerative agriculture is not a monolith. There are many schools of thought, so principles might be debatable, but essentially it's moving towards uh, no or low tillage practices or infrequent tillage practices. Uh, tilling uh, disturbs the microbiology and smashes fungal networks, which are incredibly important to the overall health of the ecosystem. So that's why we want to reduce tillage. Uh, using ground cover and cover crop rotations to rejuvenate and uh, reinvigorate the soil. For example, in my cannabis beds in the off season, I sprout 20 or 30 different types of seeds in that space from grasses that cycle the phosphorus to legumes, beans, peas, those um, fix nitrogen back into the soil. Many people may have heard of nitrogen fixation. Uh, clover also achieves that. so I do a lot of clover as well. So all of these things um, move us away from a monocrop or a monoculture, which is when you just see a huge field of just one type of plant. That is a monocrop. And it is very easy to succumb to disease and pest. It doesn't have its innate pest resistance and disease resistance because it's not communicating as an ecosystem. Um, so I just try to have lots and lots of diversity. That's pretty important for regenerative agriculture is diversity of species. You saying that yeah. reminded me of the uh, intelligence of trees or intelligent trees, a, mm -hmm. um, a documentary I just watched. And, you know, these scientists were, you know, watching through a microscope, you know, how these trees were talking to each other and how they do perform better when there were a variety of trees um, there versus, you know, the, the monocropping that we do with, you know, the redwoods that get chopped down and things like that. They're like, well, we're, we're reforesting, but it's not the same as having this, you know, diverse ecosystem. So seeing that documentary just makes this make way more sense because this is, you know, same thing, different plant. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. All plants are communicating <laughs> with each other. Um, here, I'll go down a tangent for, for a quick minute. I'll give a, a very high level microbiology lesson. Um, uh, a, a diverse array of plants above ground is what can lead to diverse microbiology under the soil surface, which is what we're after. And plants uh, photosynthesize and push sugars, exudates through their roots to then attract microbiology to them, which then in turn exchanges the nutrients from the soil that it's looking for. If the plant needs nitrogen, it exudes a certain kind of carbohydrate that then attracts the microbe that will bring it nitrogen. If the plant needs phosphorus, it will do the same process to attract the fungal strand or microbe that will bring it phosphorus. And so that is how a natural system works. It's this give and take relationship, symbiotic closed loop system of plants and microbes. Um, it's when we lack that diversity uh, or we disturb their home by tilling it um, or digging it up uh, recklessly that we interrupt those processes and then we start to experience all kinds of issues. So for someone who's starting out and they have dirt, they don't have soil, you know, what are these first steps 
to taking to, you know, creating living soil, starting to create that environment? What are those first things you do? It's a great question. Um, well, first, a, a soil analysis is going to be pretty essential to see what the composition of your native soil is. Out here in California, we have an abundance of clay in my area. My farm is 100% compacted red clay, which is not fun at all. Uh, it is high in minerals, but it's lacking organic matter uh, and requires a lot of working right, because it's so compacted. If you have a more sandy loam type soil, then you're sort of in a better position to need less initial input. So the first step is to analyze your soil and possibly even do uh, an NPK fertility test on the soil. Uh, they're available through mail-in laboratories for under $50 or sometimes through local garden stores for about 100 uh, And so then you actually know what you're working with. Uh, without knowing what you're working with, you could go in the wrong direction very easily. Typically, the uh, recipe for amending most native soils is to add organic matter. That means good, healthy, homegrown compost in a perfect world would be homegrown. Um, or ideally from a small compost, that small batch compost provider, someone that is making it on a farm or a ranch out of local and diverse material. So that compost adds the organic matter component to the mineral composition that is your likely your native soil. So someone that's kind of speaking from the perspective of California. So I get no, so someone in the comments said, um, do you use clippings in your compost? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So what yeah. all goes uh, in What all goes in a good beefy compost? Sans uh, meat, obviously. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad uh, So, so, <laughs> so with, with compost, I'm also looking for the most diversity possible. Uh, I will sometimes purchase bales of grass from the local feed store if I can find organic or unsprayed ones. Uh, that means mixed field grass or orchard grass. Uh, if there's seeds in it, that is okay if you get your compost to cook up to the proper temperature, uh, which is really what thermophilic composting is about, is getting your material to cook. So I'll start with grass and wood chips and manures. That is the basic recipe. Um, within each one of those, you'd like diversity. If you can have 10 different kinds of woods blended, that's going to be ideal. Uh, you don't want to be too heavy on softwoods or pine when it comes to wood chips. Um, you can use pine, but you want to let it age until it no longer smells like pine. And then uh, manures, again, diversity. I have alpacas Reach and chickens. For that. I'm sorry. I had just have to know. On the pine, for the thing. aged pine. So the uh, oils the, that create that strong pine smell, uh, the pine can be, yeah, pine amongst other things uh, can be antimicrobial and will actually inhibit the growth of beneficial microbes oh. until it has evaporated off. And so you just let it age for a year or less. There's ways that you can speed up that process by treating wood chips with. Uh, things like EM1 or uh, Makashi, those sort of things. Um, we can get into that later. Um, but yeah, pine is okay. You just got to let it sit around for a while or blend it with lots of other things. I'm very fortunate. I have lots of oak here and a variety of oak species and lots of brush. And so that makes for a really good combination. Um, and then manures here at Down Home Farms, we've got alpacas and chickens. And so I use both of those. Uh, alpaca manure is, I think, the best. I, I think I'm a little uh, impartial because they're my friends. Um, but it's, it's very microbially active. It's, they just eat grass. Um, and anything that comes in a pellet form, alpaca poo comes in tiny little pellets, same like rabbit poo or deer poo. Um, these things are very good for their microbial content, as opposed to like dairy manure or something. Um, and then, you know, the last pile I made here with some friends, we had alpaca, um, pig, 
horse, and I think some goat as well. So, you know, basic recipe, poop, wood chips, grass, and then within each one of those, you'd like to try and diversify as much as possible. I mean, this is the most fun talk about poop I've had in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of my good friends, um, his farm's motto is scoop, poop, plant seeds, stay humble. That is what it is to be a small farmer, um, scooping poop and being happy about it. <laughs> Head on. Yeah, this is true. So talk to me a little bit about the worm farming. Okay, sure. Yeah. So here on the farm, we, we make our compost, uh, which is uh, cultured to be a fungal dominant compost. And then once that process is completed, we give it to the worm farm. So these are 100% homegrown compost fed worms. Uh, and then we top it off with a big layer of fresh alpaca poop. And I have very large boxes, wooden boxes, with free-flowing drainage out the bottom. And those serve as my worm farm. Um, if you look on my Instagram, I think there's some photos of them somewhere. And then each box uh, processes for between one and two months. That's about a yard and a half of material that will then shrink down into about a yard of clean worm castings. And I either take that material and put it directly into my gardens, worms and all, uh, or I will sometimes sift it gently. I do have a very large sifting device called Trommel, but I have not actually used it yet. I'm not really big on sifting the worm castings because it disturbs the microbiology. Um, with all this composting and worm farming, I'm not just trying to create organic matter, I'm trying to create microbially dense inoculation. I am microbe farming. Uh, I seek a higher density of microbes per handful um, than most products on the shelf would have in a whole bag of their compost or work castings. Wow. So are you testing um, that as well? So, you know, you told us to yeah. test our soil and then um, how are you testing that to see where, you know, where the microbes are? Sure. Yeah. So I, um, uh, I studied with the, um, living soil food web school, Dr. Lane Ingham many years ago. And I've also studied with a couple of other people on microscopy and learning how to identify microbes and understanding the food chain within the soil food web. Uh, and so I have a microscope and, uh, in a typical week, I'll spend one to five hours in front of my microscope analyzing the tiny little organisms that exist in the ground under our feet that really are the foundation of all life on this planet. Uh, if, we, if we don't respect these things that we can't even see, we will no longer be able to grow food or breathe air or anything else. Uh, these tiny yeah. things that, that weren't even known to scientists until 40, 50 years ago um, are really the foundation of all growing green plants. Yes, I had um, Jeff and, and Diane there. They created this product called Slow Dirt. And, you know, they, they're they like our topsoil, like this is a, a thin layer of hope left. And everyone needs to learn to understand and respect it. And back to the, the, the principles of regenerative agriculture, you know, cover crop rotations, diversity, uh, crop rotations, um, low tillage, all of these things are to increase the organic matter content, uh, sequester carbon, and what that does is create topsoil. Topsoil is the greatest thing we have on this planet to sequester carbon. Uh, even the microbes themselves exist to sequester carbon, they're carbon-based life forms. And so the more topsoil that we wash away into the rivers and oceans uh, through tilling of hundreds and hundreds of acres, um, that takes ages to grow back. There are, there is hope with regenerative agriculture methods. It's been shown that one can build inches of topsoil a year at large scale. Um, if somebody is looking for a good book to read, 
Gabe Brown, Dirt to Soil. Phenomenal book mm -hmm. on large scale regenerative agriculture, uh, including animal rotation and everything else. On his many, many, many thousand acre ranch, I think in Dakota or Montana, um, he, I believe, says he built 20 inches of topsoil in about 15 years, which wow. is miraculous. Wow. Uh, it, it can take nature on its own a uh, hundred years to grow an inch. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm really, thank you for that book recommendation because, you know, one of the things that I, talk with my family about is, you know, I want to figure out how I can come home and evangelize this message to all of the farmers in the communities around where I grew up, where my family's ranch is. And, you know, it's, it's like, how, how can I either get all of my people to come here and us do these workshops? Or I'm like, now I can just buy them all this book. <laughs> get them that book. He is, he he's, comes from an old school ranching background and he learned a lot on his own. Incredibly smart guy, goes around the country sharing his story these days, but that book is absolutely inspiring. So yeah, spread the word, dirt to soil. Yes. So, you know, one of the other things that I feel like you do well is um, besides partnering with nature, partnering within your community, like, you know, when you're doing all of these things and you're saying, you know, a diversity of grasses and manures and, and wood chips and things like that, you know, a lot of times it's working with your farmer friends and everybody doing yeah. this together. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it definitely takes a community. Uh, again, looping back into the principles of regenerative agriculture is community engagement. Uh, we, we are not islands. Uh, I could make my farm as beautiful as I want, but if I don't uh, give back to the community in tangible ways through education or maybe food supply for the less fortunate or something else, um, then we're not having the impact uh, on, the, on the global scale that we need to have. Uh, so community engagement is really important to me. Um, well, to start, Grass Valley Growers Cooperative uh, is a cooperative of 10 separate permitted family farms here in Nevada County. Uh, we, we've all been growing cannabis in an organic, righteous way for a very long time. Some of our members have been growing for 30, 35 years. Uh, phenomenal people that are engaged in their community and always have been. Um, so that was that was one of the biggest steps uh, I've, I made towards community engagement was helping to co-found Grass Valley Growers. Uh, and so that's a great thing. We have branded products and we sell our we sell our weed together as a brand out there across the state. Uh, and then additionally, we've done a few workshops here at the farm. Um, actually, we've managed to do one every year, I think, so far uh, on compost building, comp uh, worm farming and soil building and micro farming in general, just trying to encourage and educate more people on these practices so they can, uh, they can make a change on their own. Yeah, absolutely. So some of these workshops that workshops that y'all have done, um, have you videoed them? Do they live on the grass Valley growers website, co-op website? Where would people find them? So we didn't, so we didn't film the workshops in their entirety. Uh, editing them would it's kind of not in the budget, uh, but I have put out a number of videos and there's another one to come soon. Um, one of the videos I put out on the Grass Valley Growers YouTube page, and it's also accessible through Down on Farms Instagram, is on Hugel Culture. Uh, Hugel Culture is, uh, well, I'll go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, um, no. It's a, <laughs> it's an ancient Germanic farming technique. It goes back thousands of years that involves burying large amounts of organic matter, logs, branches, uh, grass, wood chips, in the ground or making a berm and a swale on a slope using all of this material. And then you cover it with some native soil and you have this big layer cake of, again, grass, wood chips, compost, manure, um, and topsoil. And over a couple of years that breaks down into an incredibly fertile, healthy 
a gardening space that has phenomenal water holding capacity, which is really helpful out here in California. Most of my gardens are constructed as hoogles, as we call them for short. And that, uh, that keeps my water usage very, very minimal to have less impact in the drought. And then even in wet areas, if you happen to be in a flood zone, not in California, uh, hoogles can be really great for getting up off of the floodplain. You can build them up quite high. And then I, I have a friend that's been reporting to me. He, he planted in the, top of the, in the top of the hoogle mound. He watered a few times after planting. And then the taproot got all the way down to the groundwater where it's very, or to the ground where it's very wet. And he's now been dry farming for the entire summer, as in not having to water at all. Uh, also not experiencing any root rot or fungal pro root fungal problems uh, as a result of the roots being too wet. The whole pile actually starts to wick the proper amount of moisture up into it if the groundwater is high. It's a really amazing, amazing thing. And uh, to boot, it sequesters a ton of carbon. Um, you know, if you're clearing uh, brush and, and trees for fire safety, uh, you can burn it, which releases the carbon back into the atmosphere. It's not very efficient, or you can bury that and turn it into healthy soil and sequester 100% of that carbon. So riddle me this, if you're doing this and it's um, not on the side of a hill and you said you can go very deep, like if you're, would you be digging that out? For like how deep would that go? So that's a question of what's your soil composition. If your soil is brown and, and uh, has some, some drainage, maybe it's sandy loam, which is great, then yes, you want to dig a trench, full-on trench, and fill it with, um, again, on my Instagram page, there's actually uh, a step-by-step a, a -step image slide through of the oh. filling process. You can see the large oak logs and then all the brush and then grass and et cetera. Um, and so that you, you'd actually dig a full on trench. Whereas at my house, uh, I have pure clean red clay with almost no drainage. That's my native soil, which is not a good place to have a farm, by the way. Um, and so they're more appropriate on slopes where they then uh, still have quite a bit of drainage and then provide a little terrace space, which is nice. Um, or I've actually ex also experimented with raised hoogle beds, which are working very, very well. Uh, I just made an extra large raised bed and fill it in the same manner with big logs at the very bottom. Okay. And I'm liking that a lot. Right on. And that's something someone who, you know, doesn't live out on a farm, you know, being able to recreate yeah. this in a backyard garden in a raised bed like that. Yeah, your shit's blowing up. <laughs> Oh, you can hear all that? Oh, it's okay. like silence. You're a very important person. Uh-oh. Oh. Um, you know, I'll touch on that. Uh, Hold on. Repeat what you just said. Permitted... You, froze, you froze a little bit, so just repeat what you just said. Oh, I was just saying I'm, I'm not just a farmer. Um, with regulations being a permitted cannabis farmer means I don't just get to play in the field with plants all day. Uh, there's constant communications, uh, managing our brands, communication with our sales team, our distribution facilities. Uh, it's a lot of work, not to mention all of the paperwork, administrative work, bookkeeping, uh, tax remittance. Um, thank you to my beautiful and wonderful wife. She's our bookkeeper and she's phenomenal at it. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than just farming these days. Well, since we're on that subject, I want to go down that road a little bit, but I promise um, there's a few comments that we will get to um, going back to topsoil and some genetics and things like that. But, you know, oh, cool. you've been a, a licensed California cannabis grower for a while now. So, you know, let's look at this from the beginning, is your cost of doing business going up or going down? Or do you feel like things are getting easier or more complicated? That's a good question. Um, the cost of business is uh, neither going up nor down, but revenue is going down. 
uh, due to massive oversupply in the market due to gigantic mega corporations putting up 20, 50, hundreds of acres of cannabis canopy. Um, small farmers are being pushed to the edge. Uh, there is a massive problem right now where you know, mega farms that were essentially supposed to be limited for some number of years um, were then allowed to proceed. This happened at the advent of Prop 64. Prop 64 had a, a, a contingency that was meant to protect the small farmers. Big farms were not supposed to be allowed for X number of years. And then that provision disappeared in the middle of the night. And then yes. now those big farms are, year. yeah, very last second. Uh, I just actually also want to say, I didn't vote for Prop 64. I voted no, but I also complied. I, um, I was one of the first farmers in my county to get permitted. Uh, and I, I don't regret that. Um, I'm glad I'm able to be here with everyone today and be public about uh, what I do and share uh, this good information. And I wouldn't be able to if I wasn't legal. Um, that being said, it's getting harder and harder. Uh, the market as a whole does not recognize true craft cannabis. They barely recognize organic, let alone beyond organic and regenerative practices. Um, I have I have my brands out there and we have our loyal followers that I'm so grateful for. Um, but if we can't expand our footprint, if we can't get our product out there directly in our brands to more people, uh, we won't actually be able to survive because all of the other hundreds of brands that aren't based on any values or morals, uh, it's just, you know, price point and high THC percentage is sometimes all they focus on. Um, they have no reason to buy from us small farmers. They can get it for dirt cheap from a company that grows it with chemicals. Uh, and we as small farmers cannot make those same prices. We just can't match those prices, but we create a superior product. Um, true craft cannabis to me is about building soil or, you know, honing your own genetic uh, pool. Um, th those are the crafts of cannabis. Um, it's not about putting up some giant mega facility that costs zillions of dollars and pouring things out of a bottle into a water tank. That is not craft cannabis. Show me where the craft is in there. Craft means artisan. Um, that is what we uh, hope for people to recognize, hope for the consumers of California and beyond to recognize. So and that's the long and the short of it. So. Well, I think a big responsibility lies on the bud tender and the dispensaries. Well, the dispensaries first to make sure they're stocking craft cannabis in their store and then giving these bud tenders the information and the knowledge to then tell the story of why they should know their farmer, why this cannabis costs more than this other stuff that has, a, you know, a, a really slick label on it and comes in a, you know, an expensive box that is just wasteful. You know, it's like we have, there's so many barriers to even getting to the point of sale and being able to have that conversation. That's why I feel it's important to have people like you on the show, because it's my way of stressing the importance of knowing your farmer, but um, it is more expensive, you know, to buy good cannabis. And, you know, we, that should be our way of voting with our dollars is like, I choose my farmers, you know, I choose to support my community. And, and when you understand the, the principles of sustainability, you understand the amount of work and effort that goes into it, then you're proud to spend that extra money. But people, consumers need to know that story. Absolutely. Um, we're going to so, keep telling it and putting it out there. And I appreciate your perspective a whole lot. And, uh, and I just want to acknowledge somebody in the chat. They said, there are co connoisseurs who want true genetic expression, full potential living soil, native soil grow. And yes, you're absolutely right. You are out there and we appreciate you. 
I talk to y'all every day on social media. And every time somebody reaches out and says, I want to smoke weed grown with love, it keeps me going for another day. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Amen. So now tell us a little bit about your genetics, because I know there's some folks well, interested. I'm actually all over the place with genetics. I don't have anything I would call my own right now. Um, I try to do things that are uh, a little bit different than what everyone else is doing. I'm not growing ice cream cake. I'm not growing wedding cake. I don't know. Whatever this year's dessert most popular thing is. Um, I'll, I'll do, you know, I'll do a cool new cross of that. So I, I'm about to release uh, cherry AK crossed with punch, cherry punch from Symbiotic Genetics. That's about to hit the streets. And it is amazing, deep chocolate cherry flavor, um, bright green with some little purple hues on it. And then um, that is also gonna be followed up by Sherb Crasher, uh, Sherbert, Sunset Sherbert Wedding Crasher. Uh, that one absolutely killed the test results. It's super, super strong. I generally don't I focus on THC percentage. Yeah, yeah, they're both really, really flavorful. Um, so I'm excited to, to, to have those out really soon. Um, but then I'm, I'm an original, I'm a sour diesel grower. That was my bread and butter for years. It's what I grew when I was a kid. I love sour diesel, the real thing. Um, I love chem dog. I love that whole family of skunk, which isn't quite as popular anymore. Uh, but I'm growing uh, a really phenomenal cut of chem dog. So I'll have a bunch of chem dog coming out soon. Uh, and then I also have a special cut, um, I'm sorry, seed run. Uh, shout out to the breeder Skunk VA, uh, the holder of the true chem dog. And uh, this is a cross of theirs called Schism, which is two strains. It is their special chem dog crossed with a strain called This Is The Shit. T I T S. <laughs> and if you know what that is, it was fucking awesome. It came around five, ten years, five, six years ago, and people don't really see it anymore. Yeah, um, I'm so not yeah, cool. I, I didn't know it. I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's called Schism from Skunk PA, yeah. and I'm pretty excited. It's it's that classic funk gas, probably super potent. The plants are very voluminous. Um, and yeah, it's looking really good, super frosty. Um, so yeah, that's some of what I got going on. I'm always looking for, for good new breeders to try out their stuff also. So uh, to those listening, send me some recommendations too. I'm always checking stuff out. Right on. Now, you know, I believe that farmers are, you know, should be up on a, pe on a pedestal and, and, just revered for what they do all year long. Um, but you really don't get a lot of, I don't know, time in the spotlight until it's harvest season. So I want you to kind of talk us through, you know, what each season looks like for a craft cannabis farmer, because, you know, I know that it's you, you know, your wife's keeping the books, but it's you and the alpacas and the chickens you know, getting it done out there. So tell me what that's like. Yeah. All right, that's that's a good question. Yeah, so um, typical season, um, I'll start in about January making my uh, crop planning. Um, I'll, I'll do strain selection even as early as November the year before, uh, hunting seeds in October and November for the next year. And then January I start, um, doing crop coordination, figuring out what strains are going to be planted where in my garden. At that point, I've got cover crop go growing in all my beds about a foot tall. Uh, going, I'm also starting to turn my compost a lot more and build more compost piles. That's a, a big thing I do in the, the down season um, because it's cooler and it's wet, so it's safe to use my chainsaw. So I'm cutting brush and um, thinning the forests on the edges of my property and turning it into wood chips. And so then I use those wood chips for compost fuel. And um, 
plus there's free water coming from the sky. Compost takes a lot of water. So it's kind of nice if I can just build compost piles and then get rained on. There you go. Um, so that's something I'm doing a lot in like January and February. And then February, uh, I'm starting to chop and drop uh, some of the cover crop in my greenhouses because it grows a lot faster. Uh, and then I do push top that chopped cover crop. And then all the worms that are already in come up and eat all that cover crop and digest through all that compost and make it this nice, beautiful humus layer. Um, and then in March, I basically am starting to think about planting the greenhouses toward the end of March. Uh, that is if I'm going for three rounds. Um, so I'm planting greenhouses in March. Uh, from that point forward, every morning and every night, uh, I'm out there for a couple of hours doing one task or another, whether it be watering, or pruning, or trellising. And then also basically from March until September, um, I'm, a, I'm a slave to the tarp, pulling the light deprivation tarp over the greenhouse to control the light cycles. Um, mine is not automated, so I have to be there at a specific time every morning and every evening to open and close the greenhouses. Um, so I'm just kind of there a lot. Uh, yeah. And then that going into, <laughs> what's that? I said that becomes church. Yes, it, yeah, it does. it's just it's just what I do. Uh, it doesn't even feel strange. It's just part of the routine. Uh, and then in March or so, I'm probably planting seeds for the full sun plants. I prefer clones in the greenhouse and seeds outside. And then, um, so I'm popping seeds in like March or even February if I'm looking to have really, really big plants. Uh, and then the veggie crops start to go in and the veggie gardens, um, which have been limited in recent years uh, because I haven't had my water systems in place. But then the veggie, the veggie crops kind of start to take off in April, lots of lettuces and brassicas. And, um, what is well, your what is your water solution? Do you use um, the clay pot systems with your veggies? Do you you said your water system wasn't in place? So what is it? Well, so what I mean by that is that I'm not a big fan of irrigating from a well. Uh, the vast majority of cannabis farmers do irrigate from a well, and it's okay if you have a strong well and you, you know, keep your water usage reasonable. Um, you know, my, my farm is actually not any bigger than some people's hobby gardens. Um, but I also at my farm have access to plentiful irrigation water, which is held in a reservoir a mile up the road. It's actually a remnant of the gold mining era that uh, existed in, in Nevada County in gold country. Um, these water ditches existed to uh, bring water to the mines and also to the ranches that supported the mines. So I have a pond that I'm able to fill repeatedly throughout the summer. I use that for some of my crops. And then just this year, I got lots of more water tanks. Uh, and so then going into next year, I'll have lots and lots of water storage. Uh, I'll also be doing rain catchment off the roof of my house. And all that adds up to just more water that I feel good about growing things with as opposed to pulling more water out of my well. Yeah. You know, that is, has to be such an important consideration for any farmer of anything in California. And, you know, with the, the water stipulations now, you know, the, where I live, um, the grapes are being harvested tonight, starting at 11 PM. And, you know, it's like, we haven't been able to water things and it's like they, it's time they got to go. And, you know, that's a really scary, you know, rope to, to walk for a farmer when your entire livelihood is counting on this one season's harvest. So, um, you know, knowing that you have that, your water system in place is important, but figuring one out that is not being wasteful of water. That's why I love the, clay pot, the idea of the clay pots. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned the clay pots. I think those are such an awesome uh, solution to uh, a small scale, medium scale hobby gardener. 
Um, I have a, a variety of irrigation solutions, not only you know, native soil and heavy compost, both use less water. Uh, most, most weed growers use a smart pot with fluffy soil in it. And the amount of water I use per pound is about 20% of what someone in a smart pot with potting soil uses. So that's a really big difference. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, I'm using less water due to regenerative practices. Uh, and then as much as possible, I'm trying to use alternative water sources, not groundwater. Um, rain catchment ponds or uh, rain catchment off your roof, uh, or if you're blessed with uh, an irrigation ditch or something along those lines, these are all really, really good options. Groundwater awesome. is a limited resource. So, you know, one of the things that I've, you know, read and you touched on earlier was the, um, the yoga and meditation thing. And, you know, that, you know, mindfulness obviously is a theme through everything you do in your life. Are there some things that you have brought into the garden, um, that are some maybe practices that you do? Do you, you know, do you sing to your girls? Like, what do you do to, to kind of get your vibe right in the garden? So you got me laughing because, you know, it's a practice. Meditation is a practice. Um, there are times in my life that I have been very zen. Uh, then there's times in my life where I've not been very zen. I think most people perceive me as pretty level, um, but I definitely try to bring calm and peace to the garden. The garden is my happy place. Um, I think my years of, of yoga education uh, come into play in the garden in a lot of ways. There can be a lot of contortionism and stretching and strenuous physical labor, uh, repetitive stuff in the garden. Uh, I get a kick out of kind of balancing while watering and stuff like that, like the, you know, balancing on one foot and reaching way far out. Um, so I guess that maybe plays a role. I definitely play a lot of music. My my garden here's. Uh, a lot of Grateful Dead, he said a lot of reggae, a lot of classic rock, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, down ohm, um, you know, the, the, the ohm is a thing to strive for, that peace and tranquility. And so it's a reminder for me to continue to practice. Yes. Namaste all day, my friend. Okay, so one thing that really probably grinds your gears is what's happening with the the Kim Ag stuff. You know, I've seen you do a couple of little, I want to call them rants, but they're all very educational and <laughs> oh, rantish, <laughs> very rantish. Uh, yeah, so I mean, what the I, I I've been ranting a lot about um, you know what's happening to small farmers, chemical industrial agriculture. Uh, has been um, been considered conventional. It's considered the norm for a long time now, and organic somehow the exception. Uh, and I think that that's just totally absurd. And cannabis is no different. Um, there is dozens, if not hundreds, of companies in the state of California that are growing huge amounts of cannabis using pure chemicals grown in soilless media that gets thrown in a dumpster or a landfill after they use it. And the soil, uh, soilless media is being drenched with salt fertilizers, which are petrochemicals. Um, they have no natural source. And they are also limited in their, uh, at least some of them are actually limited in their uh, abundance. Like it's not something that we can just create with electricity forever. Um, they're taking mined materials and refining them. And all this adds up to dead soil. There's no way to, um, once you start feeding these kinds of chemicals, you have to keep feeding them. The plants become addicted to them. Biologically speaking, the plant no longer knows how to interact and speak with the 
bacteria and the mycorrhizae and the fungus. And so it's then disconnected from nature and it's hooked on these chemicals. And then this runs off into our rivers and into our oceans and causes algae blooms. Um, right now across California, partially as a result of drought and possibly for other reasons, there's algae blooms in rivers that if your dog goes swimming in it, it'll kill them instantly. This happens every year. Um, the kelp forests are dying off the coast of California. You know, these things are happening as a result of agricultural runoff. Um, I can go on and on and on, but it's toxic for the environment, not to mention uh, it's these big farms are just putting money into essentially like Wall Street types pockets. Um, big companies in California are uh, very, very rarely from um, grassroots. Uh, many of them maybe their entire business plan is to put small farmers out of business by undercutting them. They, and these companies are polluting. And if we don't actually change minds of consumers at large, uh, we, we will just give up the entire cannabis industry to mm, Monsanto, essentially. Uh, I'll just call it out. Monsanto itself now owns uh, over a dozen large grow supply companies. I'll just stop there. <laughs> right. Yes. Now, how do we know, you know, which, because I don't, I mean, if I go into a cannabis dispensary, you know, I do see if something is sun grown and, you know, the farm that it's from, but if somebody's just grabbing a pack of pre-rolls from somewhere or getting the house brand, um, you know, cannabis cultivars, you know, if you don't know where it's coming from, it's probably coming from one of these giant farms. Because yes, the people that, that are growing really good way. all, they know that it's important to say, yo, hey, we're organic, we're sun and earth certified, we're, you know. So if you don't see that, to me, that's the red flag. Yeah, you're absolutely so that's right. That's the choice you're yep. making at that point. That is the choice. Yeah, if it does not say clearly where it's coming from, uh, then you can pretty much be guaranteed that it's from a farm that doesn't uh, necessarily have an interest in the environment or their community. It's not. It's possible that they do also, but they're probably going to shout it out. And if it's a farmer-owned brand, uh, they're also going to say so. Uh, Almost every brand has either a website or social media presence. I encourage you to find a brand that fits your values. Um, and if you can't find it at your local store, tell them that you want it and keep telling them that you want it. Um, I'll just put some things in front of the camera. A really great way to know that your cannabis is coming from um, a good source is that stamp right there, Sun and Earth Certified. They certify only small farms that practice sustainable and regenerative practices uh, and are engaged with their community in positive ways. Um, I myself am certified by that group and I, I love them a lot. Um, some of the brands that uh, I helped to co-found and you can find my product through, um, this is Grass Valley Growers Cooperative, grassvalleygrowers.com. Um, this is the Growers Reserve line, um, and this is available around Sacramento, um, Nevada City, Tahoe, Truckee. Um, if you ever have any questions, you can just check me on Instagram. I will totally respond. And then the other brand that um, oops, there it is uh, that I'm a part of, happy to be a part of, is Farm Cut. We are all Sun and Earth certified, uh, licensed regenerative family farms. And what Farm Cut is, is uh, we try to make the kind of a farm, farm direct experience. This mason jar is how farmers share our buds with each other in nice large jars. It's minimally processed. It's basically just uh, very, mis uh, very lightly trimmed. And that's how we share it with each other because it preserves the terpenes, it preserves the trichomes preserves the integrity and the essence of the flower. When you trim the hell out of a flower 
and you stick a tiny amount of it in a jar and it might sit on a shelf for a couple months, it loses a lot of its vitality. And so we feel like Farm Cut uh, kind of gets the buds to the consumer in a, in a fresher, more intact way. And that is me. Beautiful. You know, some of the things that I want to highlight that you mentioned was, you know, if we want to try Down Elm Farms, you know, Sacramento area, Nevada City, that that region. And so, you know, I encourage you to think about cannabis the way you think about wine. And when you go somewhere new, when you're traveling, you know, ask who are some of the area farmers? Like, I want to try the cannabis from this region and, you know, just explore, make yourself a canosaur, but you're also supporting local farmers versus, you know, buying the weed with a giant question mark on it. Because, you know, I do know a lot of farmers that sell their stuff through a distributor where when it leaves their farm, they don't know where it goes. So I do know that good stuff gets white labeled under a dispensary, but, you know, if you want to know for sure know your farmer, sun and earth certified, know that people are doing things sustainably and that they, they give a shit about you and about creating this kumbaya experience between us and our planet. So Daniel, thank you so much for doing what you do and being who you are and, and rattling those chains. I appreciate that. I'll be here. I'll keep rattling those chains. And thank you for giving me a, a megaphone to do it with. Absolutely. So scroll through here. I think in in real time, we were catching the questions, but see if we maybe missed something because you're the expert. Oh, okay, here, I'll start at the top. All right, so I've definitely used clippings in my compost. The stalks, branches, and all the cannabis leaf is a huge part of my compost and really, really great for it. Plain and simple, uh, if you compost cannabis, it's gonna have everything, most everything that you need to grow cannabis in it. So uh, is there any veggies I recommend to organically use or in homemade compost? Um, diversity, diversity, diversity. But I will say, you know, I grow a lot of melons and squash and squash and melons um, and corn debris, all that adds to be good uh, potassium and phosphorus. So that's nice to add into my compost to boost the potassium and phosphorus. Now, one thing mm -hmm. I'll ask a question regarding compost. How do you keep the critters out of it? What do you do to protect it? Well, um, uh, for food scraps, which is what critters would be after, those go to my chickens. And so then the chickens just, boom, snatch it up in a heartbeat. And then they process it for me. And then I collect what Perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they're so cute. Uh, anyway. And then they give you. Yeah. Eggs. I got, they give us delicious eggs. If you've never had a farm egg, go find a real good free range farmer and try a farm egg. They are just next level. It's really, uh, gosh, I remember a long time ago when I had my first one, uh, my mind was pretty blown. I don't, I don't come from a, farming family or anything like that. So it was all new to me. Where are you from? Uh, upstate New York, just a little bit north of New York City. Okay. Yeah, yeah just kind of right where suburbs turn to forest. You came a long uh, way, somebody... baby. <laughs> yeah, sure did. Uh, can topsoil be washed out during the off season? Uh, yes, if it does not have cover crop or ground cover growing in it. That's why you want to always have roots, always have something growing in your soil, because it actually uh, holds it together. Um, let's see. So it's, uh... mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, somebody said, yeah, I mean, they're like like you also said, Joe, there's a lot of really good farms out there that do wholesale their product to brand A, B, or C. Uh, but if they are not being 
well represented on the label as the farmer, um, it's not likely that they are being fairly compensated. It's probably just, it's just my opinion, but it's probably what's going on out there. Uh, farmer owned and operated brands um, or you know, things that are certified uh, sun and earth guarantees uh, fair wages to farmers. That's kind of what they're about too. So that's how you can guarantee that the farmer is actually getting paid a fair wage uh, and a fair wage you know, just uh, for perspective, you know, people can see my farm online and see how big it is, um, does not support a family of five. Uh, I have, you know, second and third jobs, but that is the way of the small farmer. That's how it's been for small farmers for a long time now. Um, they have a second or third job to keep the dream alive farming. And to keep yourself from being in business for the bank, you know, mm -hmm. the majority of my life, you know, my dad was, you know, managing my family's, he's third generation managing our family's ranch. And you're constantly just robbing Peter to pay Paul to pay the bank back. And, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle that doesn't make for um, very fun times. So, you know, being able to um, at least do it where you've got the second or third job because you're like, I am, I am doing this for me. I'm not, I'm not getting, getting in bed with the bank because we can't. I mean, hell, I have a CBD business and I can't hardly find a merchant services company to work with me. So, you know, to even think about being able to be in cahoots with the bank is kind of a joke, but um but yeah i don't know that was a weird yeah. tangent sorry <laughs> it's all good yeah, hey we, we can't yeah we don't as a life as a legal cannabis farm i can't get a, a, a typical loan i can't get a bank account i'm not allowed to do any of that kind of stuff they just say nope sorry you're not allowed so i mean get another job I don't even have that. yeah just get another job and it's cool it's what it is yeah I feel you. So is there anything I didn't ask you that's important to round out our combo? Um, I don't know. I just want to say again, like reach out to me. I love engagement. I love communicating with people that want to talk about regenerative agriculture, talk about weed or whatever. Uh, if you've got a store near you, um, point me in their direction. That if you think that they should carry my stuff, anything. I love talking to people. So that's all I want to say. Yeah, and when you're in the dispensary, um, like literally shout out names of farms. Like you don't carry down on farms. Yeah, no, we got to fix that. So, you know, use your voice, ask for what you want, make sure those dispensaries are stocking things um, that are worthy of you smoking during your uh, daily reefer recap. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for hanging out. Daniel, thank you so much for taking time um, out of your day. And I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you so much. Have a great day.